And welcome everyone. We're excited to have this third offering of the Science and Practice webinar series in conjunction with the Forest Stewardship Guild and uh, the Center for Research on Sustainable Forest. I just wanted to welcome everyone on a beautiful spring-like day in, at the end of February. Um, if you remember, the, the general thrust of our webinar series this year was kind of working our way around the different forest types of, of Maine. Uh, so we've been at the Penobscot, which was our spruce fir forest, uh, down in southern Maine at the oak pine forest, at the Holt Research Forest. And today we're kind of going down east to, to coastal Maine to talk about the complexities of, of the forest there. Um, I think we have an exciting list of uh, attendees and, and Amanda Mahaffey will, will help facilitate the discussion. Uh, before we get started, I would just want to remind everyone that we're kind of partway through the series. So we have one remaining. This will be in the Range of the Lakes area. So if you're available to join us in April, that would be great. Uh, the, each webinar is, has a field tour associated with it. So folks tomorrow will be venturing down to uh, uh, the coast and looking at some of the forest there. Um, and the uh, same will be happening in Rangeley. So we're very excited to offer that. And there could be a a future event in June, so stay tuned for that. And all the information is at the center website. Before we formally got started, I just want to do our land acknowledgement statement that we want to respectfully acknowledge the Wabanaki, the people of the Don land, as the original stewards of the forest we are discussing today. Uh, the University of Maine itself is located on Marsh Island in the homeland of the Penobscot Nation, uh, where issues of water and ter uh, territorial rights and encroachment upon sacred sites is still ongoing. And the University of Maine Center for Research on Sustainable Forest supports forest research and education in the homelands of the Penobscot Nation and other Wabanaki tribal nations. And uh, we are a strong partner and support the inclusion of indigenous science and values in forest stewardship and management and research that we'll discuss today. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Amanda and go over the poll results. All right. Thank you so much, Aaron. And yes, I it's, it's exciting to think we're in the third uh, webinar and field tour of our second year of this series. Um, so we're doing pretty well. So I'm going to share the results of the poll so everybody can see who is in the room today. So where are you from? Most of us are from Maine. Um, we have another 13% from the New England region. We have 15% that are from outside of New England and we have a Canadian. Hooray, thank you for joining us. So that uh, gives you a little sense of those perspectives that are here. What background brings you to this meeting? So. Um, 42% uh, say that you are a forester, another 29% you are, say that you are another kind of natural resource professional. Um, we have a dozen scientists out there. We also have a handful of interested public and other. So we have a good mix of folks that are here um, also bringing those perspectives and questions. Ah, now here's a question for you. Are you familiar with the Scudic Peninsula and Scudic Institute? So um, less than half of you have been there. Um, another uh, almost 20% have heard of them, but have never visited. Oh, you've got to go. Um, and then there's another dozen or so that haven't, you know, that have heard of it or haven't heard of it. Um, and uh, we, yeah, we look forward to introducing you to the Scudic Peninsula, the Scudic Institute, and lots of things in that region today. So I will stop sharing, but hopefully that helps give our speakers a little bit of a sense of who is in the room and all of you, a little sense of who is in the room with you today. So um, allow me to give just a brief outline of what we're gonna be covering in today's interactive webinar. Um, we are gonna start with, uh, we have a lot of great stuff to cover. So we're first gonna hear um, a little bit about the Scudic Institute from Nick Fisichelli. And then uh, Peter Nelson is gonna give us kind of a regional look uh, from meso scale to macro scale um, at what, what is going on ecologically and climate research wise uh, in the region. Um, a key piece of the puzzle in, in this area is uh, conservation. So we're joined today by Bob DeForest from the Maine Coast Heritage Trust, who's going to outline a, a recent uh, conservation parcel and how that fits into the broader Scudic to Scudic uh, initiative. Um, and all of this matters to landowners, uh, many of whom are thinking about wildlife. So we're also going to hear a few words from Steve Dunham from Inland Fisheries and Wildlife and from Michael Jensen from the Maine Forest Service. So we've got lots of great, fast-paced, exciting uh, discussion today. And with that, I'm going to kick it over to Nick Fisichelli to get us started with the introduction to the Scudic Institute. So Nick, take it away. Great, thank you very much, Amanda, and thanks everyone for joining us today. 
Uh, Nick Fisichelli, President and CEO of Scudic Institute at Acadia National Park. Uh, we are a nonprofit partner of the National Park Service and a center for inspiring science, learning, and community for a changing world. And, and today, today's uh, webinar is, is about uh, the coastal spruce fir forest. So it sounds like in this webinar series, you got to visit the interior spruce fir forest in, in uh, the Penobscot Ex Experimental Forest. And, and upcoming will be the Montaigne Spruce Forest uh, over in the Western Mountains. And, and so today we will be here along the coast and in, in my slide here, this is the Scudic Peninsula that you see here. And primarily in the foreground, it's the Scudic District of Acadia National Park, including the Scudic Institute campus here, which is the former Navy base, and now it is uh, a National Park Service Research Learning Center and Scudic Institute, where the nonprofit partner co-leading uh, this, this center. And so we'll get into Peter and, and Bob. We'll speak a little bit more about the forest here and the mix of <clears throat> public and, and private lands here, um, including lots of great land trust preserves uh, on on this landscape. And, and one of the unique parts also about this landscape uh, here in, in, in coastal Maine is that there's a national park here in, in Acadia National Park, one of the most visited national parks in the country. If you do it on a per acre basis, it is the most visited national park uh, in, in all of the, the US. 50,000 acres of protected lands on Isla Ho, Mount Desert Island and, and, and the Scudic Peninsula. And of course, most everyone thinks of, uh, about the park as a place for recreation, the carriage roads for amazing bicycling, great hiking trails, maybe eating popovers at Jordan Pond House. Uh, but it's also a place for science. So when you think of Acadia, you should think about science. And in fact, uh, Acadia is somewhat unique in that it was a, it was established in part because of and for the purposes of of science. Here, scientific values is actually in the park's purpose statement. Its reason for being. So, Acadia National Park protects ecological integrity, cultural history, scenic beauty, and scientific values within the Acadia Archipelago and Scudic Peninsula. Uh, and so, it's really a, a core part. Of, of the park and of this part uh, of the coast of Maine. And, and as I mentioned, the role of SCUDIC is to be the nonprofit science partner of Acadia. And, and our goal is to increase understanding of environmental change and to engage people in the science and solutions. And we partner with lots of great organizations such as UMaine, uh, Maine Coast Heritage Trust, state agencies and, and others. And we also facilitate research in, in the park. There are over 80 field research projects uh, every year in, in Acadia. So this place is one of the highest, concentration, highest concentrations of environmental science research happening actually anywhere in, in the state of Maine. And through all of this science, the 140 plus years of science here, we know a lot about the forest. We know that spruce has persisted here along the coast for over uh, 10,000 years. It, it didn't disappear from the coast uh, and shift north during the warm period a couple thousand years ago. We know the, the uh, forests in the park are 40% spruce, whether you measure it by density or basal area, it's 40% red spruce. And spruce dominates in all size classes from seedlings to saplings to overstory trees. Yeah, we also know that the park's forests are always changing just within the last decade. Unfortunately, the park has lost all of its red pine due to uh, invasive insect, the red pine scale. So we are seeing changes over the last 130 years. One in six plant species that was found in the park uh, is no longer found in the park and has been uh, replaced by non-native invasive species. Uh, we also know tree pests like hemlock, woolly adelgid, and emerald ash borer are, are major looming concerns. And, and these are really, these issues and climate change are, are really driving 
the research that that we're doing and we are facilitating in Acadia and and on surrounding lands. And one of the people leading the forest research is Peter Nelson, uh, Scooty Institute's forest ecology director. And I will uh, hand it over to Peter to share more on his work uh, in the coastal spruce fir forest. Thanks, Nick. I'll just get my screen shared up here. One second. So thank you for the uh, the overview, Nick. Uh, can everybody see my screen okay? Looks good. Great. So I'm gonna give you, as Nick said, kind of a, um, a more detailed view of the science that Scudic does with respect to forests. We have other staff members that do other science in other areas of, of the ecosystems in coastal Maine. <clears throat> and I'm gonna talk about some of the, the aspects of coastal forests that make it unique when, when everybody's in the field and talk about some of the research questions and, and trends that we see it uh, from the point of view of Scudic as a partner with the Park Service, but also a research organization with uh, both bigger and more narrow views depending on the project. So where are we in the world? Uh, you know, as Amanda said, th there's a, a wide range of um, conservation happening. And this, this map, uh, which I tried many times to export with different colors, um, from a nice website from the state of Maine showing conservation uh, lands of various sorts, federal, private. And what you can see here in these light green boxes is that Northern Maine has you know, giant blocks of land with various conservation uh, states. Whereas down along the coast, it's really a speckling of, of smaller parcels with Acadia being one of the larger. And uh, this context is what uh, I wanted everybody to start with in terms of thinking about conservation of forests or anything for that matter, and that the plants and animals that live in these conserved areas will probably be trying to move between them. And so one of the things that I think fundamentally I wanted to communicate to everybody was that thinking collectively about how conservation and land management happens, when you look at a map like this and you think about conservation, clearly connections matter. And so that's, if we were to start and leave with any one thing, I wanted to point that out. Um, the research that we're doing covers a wide range of topics, uh, but it all um, for today is going to focus on the trees. And as Nick said, the, the tree that really stands out for this part of the world is the red spruce. And you know, Picea rubens is a unique individual species, um, hybridizes with its sister species. Uh, red spruce can hybridize with black spruce, it can hybridize with white spruce. Uh, but overall, it is the, the best uh, character of the cast of spruce for the environment and the climate that the coast of Maine represents. Thin, acidic soils, uh, fairly cool in the summer, uh, warmer in the winter, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But red spruce itself, those of you, many of you know, the twigs are you know, pretty similar to sister species, and you need that hand lens to get close to see those those hairs without the glands that black spruce has. But it can live up to six, 350 years. It can be a decently sized tree in terms of height, um, but you never gets huge. And I think the dynamics of the forest there are an important thing to keep in mind when we're thinking about conservation. So let's talk about uh, the red spruce a little bit more. Uh, many of you have probably seen this picture from uh, this you know, fairly well you know, established paper showing the trickle of uh, patches of red spruce that occur in the mountains down into the Appalachians, but that the core of the distribution of the character of red spruce that is the center, center of the uh, coastal forest is really uh, in the, we're just on the edge of it. And as Nick said, when the, the glaciers retreated, uh, this, this species didn't just run further north, uh, it, it stopped. And uh, I think it's sandwiched between really warmer climates that are moving north and uh, a, a really cold and, and inhospitable zone further north where black and white spruce are able to survive. But it is unique, this red spruce zone for one or more reasons. One of them that I like to key into is the fog. And there's good literature showing that red spruce is able to and is adapted to um, live in a foggy environment. And most of the places where red spruce are dominant have a high frequency of fog, especially in the summer. Some of the things that you know, make red spruce 
I suppose different um, is that it, since it is a uniquely distributed tree, its hybridization with the other spruces may impact the story that we think of uh, for the future of these forests. So um, we do know though, that if you think about red spruce as a species, because of this uh, fragmented nature of its distribution, it has a, a, some pretty unique genotypes that aren't connected with the other populations. And so, you know, thinking about planting individual trees or thinking about um, conserving the trees on a piece of property, you know, where you are connection, where you're connected uh, before the uh, future of these species would make a difference. So if you're a population of spruce that doesn't have any other um, pollen or any other individual seed coming in from any other populations, your genotype may be limited in terms of its ability to deal with the climate and that environment. Another thing to consider as any forest uh, centered study would do would, or, or, or discussion would be what are the natural disturbances in this part of the world? And um, some folks at UMaine, some folks maybe even on this call showed that there was you know, real variability in the types of disturbances that occur in these forests, but none of them are what we would call kind of stand replacing, where we would think of a giant fire coming through or something that would kill huge areas of trees. Instead, what scientists have found is that usually there's kind of this low intensity to moderate sized disturbances caused by things like spruce budworm or bark beetles or wind throw. And so within that context, let's think about the climate of this place, the coast of Maine. As I said, and as everybody knows who's ever been there, it's got warmer winters, cooler summers, less snow than the interior and more rain. But with the Maine Climate Report and the Coastal Maine uh, Report on Climate Futures has shown, and I encourage you to check it out, published by the University of Maine Climate Change Institute, uh, it shows that there's a real systematic increase in the annual temperature looking backwards. And you can see that on the top figure here. And while there's quite a lot of variability, there's definitely a trend of an increase. And there's also an, a trend of increased variability in temperature. The same is also true with precipitation, it's getting wetter. And the magnitude of these precipitation events is getting larger. So with larger precipitation events and larger temperature variability with this genetic story that I mentioned about uh, red spruce and its focused habitat in the coast with these foggy areas. There's a lot of uncertainty about what the climate will look like in the future. And some of the work that I'm gonna show you led by a colleague of mine now at the uh, Maine Emergency Management uh, uh, Organization has, will show some of the new climate zones we might propose to think about the future of this area. So towards that end, there's some research that is most pertinent to what uh, the audience here would be interested in here at Scudic. And as I mentioned, we have scientists that work on birds. We have scientists that work on the intertidal. We have folks that are education and communication specialists. And my area of expertise is uh, with vegetation broadly and more and more these days with uh, remote sensing. But the projects that we do at Scudic are, are mostly designed to have some sort of application and often they have an application for our primary partner the national park service and so some of what i'm going to tell you today will have to do with that and so uh, the three areas i'm going to mention today are work we're doing mapping tree species and health some analysis of forest structure through time for the park service across 39 parks in the eastern united states and some new climate data that helps us understand uh, both the current state of affairs as well as what the future might look like and on these two pictures here are, are indicative of some of these studies. On the left here is a, a newly installed climate station at Scudic Institute that was a part of an NSF funded project um, to both make more measurements, but incorporate scientists and teachers together. So teachers put this together, uh, measures a whole bunch of different climate uh, related variables led by folks at UNH, University of New Hampshire. And on the right here is a picture of the kinds of technologies that I'm using more often in my research this color ramp here shows the different kinds of uh, colors in the visible light. And these pictures show different kinds of platforms that different sensors that we use to see both the visible and uh, areas of the electromagnetic spectrum outside the visible to try to identify different tree species and their uh, stress signals. So just some eye candy to show you kind of what we're gonna be working on today or talking about today. So mapping tree species and health. Uh, this is an area in which we have several projects that are relevant to this audience. Uh, the picture here on the left shows a, a flight 
of uh, one of the instruments from, in this case, the drone. And these uh, drone images uh, coupled with images from uh, airborne and space-based allow us to look at the forest at different spatial scales, which is a pretty easy to understand concept. As the pixels get bigger, you see more and more forests, but it's all kind of smeared together. As you zoom in, you get to see individual canopies of trees. So one of our primary questions is, can we help forest landowners, scientists, better separate species of trees at the level of an individual tree so that we can better understand the resources on the ground. And so uh, this tile shows some of that work that's happening in um, a variety of forests, both on the coast and throughout Maine, in which we've flown the drone here um, on the second from the top and fly over forests with places with known forest composition. These red and blue and green dots here represent an, a blow up of this image. And we can then uh, assign each pixel in this image to a particular tree species based on measurements that we've taken with the instrument on the top here. And uh, the instrument on the top simply uh, ref measures the reflectance of light uh, across a wide range of wavelengths for every leaf that you clip it on. And it produces data that kind of looks like this. And the thing to take away from this is that x-axis here is wavelength, the y-axis here is brightness. And so the squiggly lines just represent the different color signatures of different trees. And these different tiles here represent the different colors uh, from these instruments that are outside the wavelengths that we can see. And the point here is that these technologies are helping the Scudic Institute and other folks at UMaine and folks in the private sector as well, better measure and manage trees because they can understand number one, where are the trees that we can see from above and two, uh, what is their condition? And one of the primary challenges that we have in that aspect is uh, illustrated here on this middle tile where you can see uh, the images uh, in this uh, inset are, are, are broken into individual polygons and those are supposed to represent trees. And so one of the things we're trying to do is understand how can we teach algorithms to incorporate both the reflectance signature of trees to identify which species it is, but also use these segmentation approaches to try to break the images apart into individual trees so that we can do things like count trees by species. Uh, so some of the other technologies that you can see down on the lower part of the image here, I'll mention here on some of the other projects that are uh, more specific to the Park Service. But the take home here is that we hope to be able to enhance the capability of scientists and managers in Maine to identify tree species and be able to specifically determine where they are and, and, and hopefully count them. And uh, also couple that with the next slide, which is that we can also estimate the health of these trees based on uh, the same sort of differences in colors. And so what you're looking at here is an example from work from a former student of mine, Catherine Chan, who graduated with the master's degree at the uh, School of Forestry there at UMaine and has moved on to do a PhD at the University of Nebraska. This work shows that she's a, she was able to do the same workflow that I just described, focused on ash trees that have been uh, more or less uh, infected by emerald ash borer. There were possible other sources of stress, but she walked around and scored these trees based on their health and then estimated uh, in a picture like this, how healthy the trees were based on their reflected signatures. And the redder the color here, the more uh, unhealthy the estimated, uh, or the, the more uh, unhealthy a tree might be based on these data. And one sort of easy example is if you look at one individual tree and pick some pixels out of trees of different health, uh, you can see that the healthier trees have a much brighter reflectance signature than the dark, than these uh, sicker trees. And so using the combination of uh, tree health and tree species, we hope to be able to enhance the ability of managers um, and, and people in Northeast United States dealing with tree stress and tree health to target where the trees are that are sick and potentially be able to do anything, do something about it. Which leads to this slide. As Nick said, um, you know, the Acadia National Park lost almost all of the red pine due to the red pine scale and nobody wants that to happen again. So one of our projects that um, was recently funded was to help the park assess where they might be um, at risk for emerald, uh, uh, emerald uh, sorry, not emerald ash borer, but hemlock woolly adelgid, which is another um, tree pathogen that has moved into our part of the world and is either in 
but yet to be verified or known, but right outside Acadia National Park. So uh, we're hoping to use those same technologies that I just showed you to try to estimate where, uh, first of all, the hemlock trees are, and then to try to estimate broadly how uh, stressed they might be. And so what we're going to be trying to do is use different scales of different imagery, as I showed. Uh, we have a drone that we're able to use in partnership with UMaine to collect high spatial resolution images. But there are also, you know, this is a big place. We also want to use images of bigger areas that still have pretty small pixels. And these strips here represent an airborne product collected by NASA called G-Lite. And I, I know folks here on the call have used G-Lite. And what I'm showing here is that G-Lite overlaps with uh, various places in Acadia National Park. And the background image is, a, um, is an image from an air, a sensor on the space station that sees hundreds of colors like the cameras that I showed earlier. And it's depicted in this little red box here, the colors that the, the instrument on the space station is able to see. And it's able to see you know, very large areas, but the pixels are very large. So combining all these different scales of imagery that can still see hundreds of colors. And some of these instruments even have LIDAR with them. Here's a inset of a LIDAR um, collection in Acadia. We hope to be able to, again, identify trees at hopefully the individual tree level or even you know, below the tree level at the case of a drone image, and then estimate what tree species uh, it might be and what might be its relative health. Switching gears to talk about a different and final aspect, or not final, but middle aspect of our, of our work. Uh, we work with the Park Service, not just at Acadia, but also across all these uh, parks in the Northeast. And the dots represent different parks in four different networks of um, the inventory monitoring program for the National Park Service, which for those of you who don't know is uh, parallel, but different than the individual parks. The inventory and monitoring program has a, a remarkable network of um, scientists that go out and collect very careful measurements in a repeated fashion that allow for very statistically robust estimates of change. And in this case, these are uh, data from the forest monitoring component of the inventory and monitoring program. And so what I've been helping with, along with uh, Kate Miller at the Park Service, is looking at trends in the parks that I've shown here through time in forests. And so what I'm gonna show you here is some trends by park that were compiled by Kate uh, Miller, but also um, we're doing the same sort of analysis by vegetation type. And what you can see here in, in brief is that um, seedlings, trees, um, and, and saplings are, are uh, doing quite different things depending on which park uh, you are, which are the top tiles there or the top uh, columns. And a red color indicates uh, a problem, a negative, a decline, and a green color indicates an increase, and a gray color indicates uh, no change at all. And just one of the things I wanted to point out here um, that these measurements taken over the last um, 10 years uh, have been uh, really carefully done in a way that you can definitively say things like, there are not any saplings, almost any saplings regenerating in a lot of these parks. And uh, there's an increase in the deer browse and being able to estimate, you know, what are the real changes in basal area uh, at these different uh, metrics, you know, whether it's a tree level or a seedling level or a sapling level to really try to tease apart which of the levels of the forest may or may not be uh, doing so well. And uh, one of the things that has been clear through these analyses is that there is apparently quite a few um, fewer saplings in the understory in a lot of these parks, except for places like where we are up in the Northeast where the, uh, the red spruce is still uh, regenerating and the understory of these, uh, these um, coastal forests still see have a, have a lot of regeneration but a lot of forests further south aren't doing so well. So that regional picture is also something that the, the Scudic Institute uh, helps the Park Service and other partners articulate, visualize, and analyze. The last thing I'm gonna mention, yep. Yeah, quick time check, <laughs> thank you. Thanks. The last thing I'm gonna mention is the climate data. Um, so uh, on the right here, you can see some climate data that has been synthesized by my colleague, Sam Roy. Uh, su supported by um, NSF Inspires, which Aaron Wiskittle and, uh, had, and others have led. And what you wanna take away from this is that here on the coast, we really have a, a variety of different types of climate zones, depending on which data you plug in. But the main takeaway here is that 
even if you divide the climate zones further and further, you can really see that there's this clear break and clear stable area in which you have uh, a, a very uh, wet and cool coastal climate that no matter how you slice it is, is going to be that way. It has been that way based on these climate data. And uh, we're trying to help resolve those climate um, boundaries by installing sensors that I already mentioned. And so Bob is gonna dive into the details of a, of a unit uh, case of a specific area that incorporates Scudic Institute into incorporating these um, climate stories, these uh, forest structure stories into a landscape story that puts it all together so that there are places for us to go and study and understand what the natural dynamics are in this part of the world. And this circle here represents that area. And I just wanted to thank the folks who have supported this work over the years, and uh, I'm gonna pass it over to Bob. Great, thank you, Peter. And thank you everyone for joining us. Um, so I will be mindful of time and I'll quickly uh, run through uh, my slides here, but I'd like to put the context, uh, uh, conservation in the context of a bit of a timeline here. And let me just pull this down. There we go. Can people see the slides? Got it. Got it, okay, great. So uh, I work for, on the land protection staff at Maine Coast Heritage Trust and we're a coastwide and uh, statewide land trust. We work predominantly in uh, the coastal zone um, one of the ways we do our conservation is through uh, geographical areas that sort of exemplify the character of the coast of Maine that we refer to as whole places. And uh, range all the way down from York River up to uh, Cobbs Cook Bay. And the area I'm gonna talk about is Scudic to Scudic. So Scudic to Scudic gets its name from uh, Scudic Peninsula here and Scudic Mountain, which is part of the Donnell Pond Unit. And so back in 1980, this is what conservation in the region looked like. You had uh, in the 1927 uh, uh, or so, there was uh, the Scudic District of Acadia National Park was uh, acquired by Hancock County Trustees of Reservation and then donated to Acadia National Park. And up here, there was a small conservation easement in the 70s um, on Adm Admiral Byrd's land, the Wikia, that was donated by the Bryan family, just a six acre parcel on Tunk Lake. Uh, in the 80s, uh, there was a concerted effort to, um, to conserve lands. The Bryan family donated a number of conservation easements on uh, Tunk Lake and uh, the Nature Conservancy in partnership with Maine Coast Area Trust and others worked with the state to uh, conserve about 14,000 acres of forest land that was uh, owned by Prentice and Carlisle and uh, Diamond Occidental at the time. So 1988, there was this amount of conservation. Uh, in the 2000, by 2000, there's um, pieces of conservation that were happening with other conservation partners. But one of the things that was starting to become of concern was this parcel right adjacent to Acadia National Park. This parcel was 3,200 acres. Um, it connected the Scudic District of Acadia National Park to the rest of the peninsula. And it was uh, being uh, proposed first in 1996 for timber harvest. And then eventually in 2005, uh, there was starts of a proposal to develop the property. And based on this, a group of conservation partners spearheaded by French and Bay Conservancy, Maine Coast Heritage Trust and the Park Service started to look at conservation options in this area and being more proactive on the peninsula and make assuring that the Scudic District of Acadia National Park remained ecologically connected with uh, the rest of the peninsula and up into the main woods. So this uh, co quote unquote eco resort would have had a golf course, about 200 villas um, and a serious network of roads and hotels. So great concern to the community. 
Um, in 2010, uh, there was a number of additional conservation uh, that was happening in the region. And uh, Maine Coast Heritage Trust started to adopt this area as a whole place. Um, we looked at this area, which is um, one of the few places on the entire coast of Maine where there's a connection between uh, the ocean and uh, the inland forest. And we started to establish priorities for landowner outreach. And so at the time, the resiliency data that uh, TNC was developing was at, wasn't at a scale to do individual parcels, but we were looking and talking to um, biologists and conservation partners on prior to, prioritizing conservation areas. So we sort of looked at these five stepping stones around riparian areas with Mill Stream, Forbes Pond, Lower West Bay Pond, Route 1 Crossing, West Bay Pond, and then building on the Donnell Pond unit. And when TNC expanded their, um, the, uh, um, the re resolution of their resiliency data, we started to look at modeling on a parcel by parcel basis to identify conservation goals and objectives. So we used a model of uh, taking the nature's network conservation design work and TNC's resilient and connected network and then built this composite resilience layer combining those two, weighting it towards TNC's uh, resiliency um, modeling. And then overlay that on uh, parcel data and then weighted it based on the size of the parcel and the attributes of the property to then come up with a scale and to identify key parcels in this region for outreach. And so that was during the uh, 2015 to 2018. And you can see um, we built with French and Bay Conservancy, the Nature Conservancy um, and other partners in the region. We started to build conservation in this region, uh, initially starting with conservation on the south part of the Scudic Woods property, that parcel um, that was endangered of development. This, I worked with the Park Service on that becoming part of Acadia National Park and the Scudic Woods Campground. And then eventually working um, with uh, the owners of that property for a donation of that property to Maine Coast Heritage Trust, which we will manage as a preserve and partnership with Scudic Institute for Education and Research. There's also a property up here that was recently acquired by about um, 14,000 acres by the Nature Conservancy. So that network of conservation um, during that period is about 60 conservation deals that occurred in that area with all these partners um, protecting close to 60,000 acres. And you can see the area of focus, um, we're working on outreach to the landowners in the interim. And this also ties in with another whole place, which is the Narragansett River watershed, where we're continuing to do work um, based on uh, river resiliency. And these are the list of partners um, for that we've been working with over that period. And it's the key to this region has been working with uh, landowner relationships and a broad network of conservation partners in order to do this conservation. So I, that's a brief overview and I'll turn it back over. That is fantastic, Bob. And I think you set us up perfectly, speaking of landowners and landowner relations. Um, we next would like to hear from Steve Dunham from Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. Um, and we'll also hear from Michael Jensen on some, uh, some, some thoughts on some of those messages that you just began outlining with those maps. So Steve, I think you had a few maps you wanted to share. I'm just going to share my screen. Go. On the themes of connectivity and conservation. All right, can everybody see the maps? Got it. All right, so yeah, so my name is Steve Dunham. I'm the regional wildlife biologist for Inland Fisheries and Wildlife um, based out of Jonesboro. So the map the state's divided into seven regions, the down east region, which is the majority of Hancock and Washington counties, as well as a teeny little piece of Penobscot. Um, 
you know, it is the region that I'm in charge of. So the, the um, and it's myself and two other wildlife biologists that handle the non-fish wildlife and then three fisheries biologists that handle the fishery side of things because apparently fish aren't wildlife. Um, but, you know, I think these conversations that we've had earlier um, really tie in to a lot of the questions that we get um, and, and er, illustrate the importance of, of sort of what we're trying to express. And so typically when a landowner reaches out and is interested in, um, you know, developing or not developing, but um, either protecting their, their property or uh, managing their property, they're usually, you know, focused on, you know, the questions that we get wildlife related are typically, you know, how can I see more deer on my property? Wow, can I see more grouse? Those are the two most popular, obviously game species tend to be, but it also, you know, it ranges. Some people want to see less of things. They want to see why do I see so many beaver on my completely wet property and et cetera. Um, to even the simple, you know, I just, I want to see more wildlife um, or, you know, how can I know that my property is healthy? And, you know, as, as we go around and, and meet with people and talk with people, those are a lot of the concerns and, and um, you know, people tend to focus obviously easily, it makes sense on their property, but a lot of times that, you know, we have to kind of talk about the larger scale the, and, and the area that they're um, situated in. Um, and as, it, or even the historical, um, <laughs> The, the the way the land has developed in the past and will continue to change into the future. And so um, we talked earlier about uh, about red spruce and how how it's changed on the landscape. And if anyone's ever read any of the uh, pollen studies where they've taken cores from from lakes across the northeast and, and across the east coast and and looked at how these species were distributed well in the past, it's it's absolutely fascinating and and. Uh, quite interesting to watch how these how much the, the landscape has changed over time and recent studies you know that have gone through um, similar pollen data and um, and other uh, tree identification methods such as coring old um, uh, old beams and houses and and uh, you know combing through historic historic records um, have found that you know the the comp, although we have probably a similar level, a slightly lower, but similar level of forestation in the Northeast after 400 years, uh, the composition has completely changed. I think all of us are, are pretty aware of that. And that, you know, things like um, American chestnut are no longer on the landscape, whereas uh, red maple is now, now much more predominant, um, as well as beach in some areas. And so, you know, something to think about. And most people's perspective, however, is just however long they've been alive. So if they've seen a lot of deer back five years you know, or uh, 20 years ago, and, and now they see fewer, you know, that's, that's concerning for them. Um, and so sometimes we have to talk about the history of, of the area and specific to down east, the, the history of, of farming and, or in New England and of farming and um, clearing land and then that land being abandoned and allowed to regenerate uh, into early successional forest and then um, you know now in various stages of, of mid mid successional forest um, uh, you know sort of across the landscape and so uh, to kind of illustrate this point we have our uh, beginning with habitat website that we can direct folks to in order to have them explore some of the wildlife habitats um, that exist around their property and in the region as a whole. And so for instance, I, if you go on and you look up Winter Harbor to look at the Scudic Peninsula, um, you know, it'll bring up these, you can find these maps um, here. And so, you know, we start with map one, which is looking at water resources and repairing habitats. So, you know, where are the rivers? Where are the ponds and lakes? Um, and kind of understand where those are in, in reference, um, you know, to a property. And then, you know, look at the high value plant and animal habitat. So this, 
um, they're going to show all of the, the habitats that would rank high enough to be protected under the Natural Resources Protection Act um, or for species that are of concern. Obviously, species like wood turtle that there's an issue with um, people potentially, you know, illegally taking or pet trade items like that are, are not going to be on there. But in general, you're going to find information about um, pertinent species that will be in the area um, that you're looking. And then kind of go further and look at the undeveloped habitat and, and um, connectivity. And so, you know, looking at a map and seeing where roads, barriers to um, wildlife passage or endangerment to wildlife or these places that are conserved, obviously we need to update some of our conserved lands because um, there's a few from Bob's uh, previous map that aren't on there, but, you know, we're seeing how their, your parcel or your client's parcel or whatever ties into the greater landscape. Um, because, you know, you can look at, you can, <laughs> you can probably manage a piece of, of property um, for any species you like in the, uh, if you will, that they will come sort of mindset. Um, but it's a lot easier if they're already in the region. So if you build the perfect wood turtle habitat in an area that has zero uh, wood turtles and historically never did, it's going to be a real long time before any wood turtles get there if they ever do, versus uh, if you create habitat for um, a cerulean warbler, you know, that's going to be migrating through the area anyways, then, hey, you're probably going to have... Um, them occupying that space you know, pretty quickly. And I think, you know, in understanding the context of the landscape, the historic uh, context of, of the habitat and understanding where things are heading, you can kind of plan uh, accordingly and develop your plans to either maintain something on the landscape that's desired or uh, promote or to help make that landscape more resilient. Um, and so, and another map area is also the wetlands, uh, wetland habitats um, across. And then if you take all of these items uh, and kind of overlay them together, you end up with a map showing the co-occurrence. And so darker areas on this map here show where you have multiple things occurring on the landscape at the same time. So whether that's riparian habitat and wildlife species or uh, intertidal areas. And so where is it darker? It's darker around your, around your streams, riparian areas, your ponds, wetlands, uh, salt marshes, you know, are, tend, are the darkest, the darkest green that you see. And so these tend to be the areas of high, high importance and areas that really need um, further protection um, on the landscape. And and so that's a way, one way that people can kind of think about how they want to manage, how they want to um, protect land as they, um, you know, develop plans for their property. And as an example too, you know, we talked briefly about salt marsh, have to if you're in the coastal region. Um, you know, this is a real example uh, here in, in the Millbridge area, um, down east of of mapping, you know, looking at, at habitat and, and the colors you're seeing are tidal marsh uh, potential given sea level rise. So using, um, you know, ArcGIS and other tools to map uh, and predict where we're going to see salt marsh. And so giving, having a buffer around these areas and protecting, um, you know, these zones to allow salt marsh to migrate as, as climate um, changes and sea level potentially rises are, are going to be really important um, in these coastal areas and, and something to consider as you move forward in time. And so, you know, those are sort of the, the types of, of questions that we tend to, to get in the region and, um, and are some of the things that we try to try to point people towards as they're as they're um, investigating and and the best thing to do is to to get them to talk with uh, my colleague Mike or any of the other folks over at, at uh, or foresters or um, over at the main forces so with awesome. that I'll transfer it over to Mike 
Thank you, Steve. Yeah, thank you for those maps and those uh, resources for landowners and for all of us that are trying to better understand all the layers of habitat connectivity that are part of that conservation picture. Um, I'd love to hear a few words from Michael um, about your, your thoughts on how do you communicate all this with landowners? Or some, what are the, some of the things that you've been hearing? Um, well, I'll introduce myself first. Thank you for, for allowing me the opportunity to be here today. I appreciate it very much. Um, as you know, my name is Michael Jensen. I'm the district forester for Maine Forest Service for uh, the Down East District. I cover uh, coastally from uh, Deer Isle uh, to Lubeck and then inland north, uh, well north of uh, the airline road. Um, some of the things that uh, keep district forest foresters the busiest um, that we see the most of is uh, we provide outreach and education to landowners to help them make more informed decisions in realizing some of their management goals. Um, we answer questions regarding climate change and carbon storage and sequestration to allow landowners to uh, adjust or uh, tailor their goals to promote a healthy and diverse forest with um, you know, of course, an emphasis on being ready and able to adapt as necessary. Um, another thing that that um, keeps us pretty busy is uh, helping landowners connect with uh, consulting foresters to have either a um, existing forest management plan uh, kind of refreshed or updated, or if, if it is getting kind of long in the tooth, we can, uh, you know, have them in touch with a consulting forester that, uh, can draft a completely new and updated plan, uh, something that's um, pretty important, especially if you're a, a landowner that's new to the property, you know, where you've got an existing management plan that, you know, could be a couple of landowners old at that point. Um, uh, something else that's that's a value, especially seeing that um, the number of forest professionals here today is uh, we provide guidance to uh, forest professionals out there, whether they be uh, foresters or, or loggers or biologists, um, whether it be regulatory or based on management goals and objectives uh, that, you know, can be based on some, you know, up-to-date current events and information that we have, uh, you know, from workshops and trainings that we do like this. Um, and, and probably one of the most important parts of, of all of these things that we provide is uh, they're, they're all provided at no cost to the to the end user, whether it be a landowner or a, a consulting forest or a logger or, or something like that. So um, pretty, pretty high value and, and um, you know, good information uh, and, and you really can't meet the price. So, uh, you know, those, those things and, and letting people know that they're, they're out there and available to them uh, are something that, um, you know, we try to keep on top of. Sounds awesome, thank you. Uh, we are so tight on time, but I would love to invite this question from any of our speakers. Um, so we've, you've all covered a tremendous amount of information, uh, maps, macro to meso scale, uh, just really, really showing um, what a landowner should be thinking about, what conservation biologists and scientists are thinking about across the region for coastal spruce fir and, and related forest types connectivity. Um, so the question that I uh, typed into the chat, um, or what are the missing pieces that landowners aren't hearing about conservation, biodiversity, climate adaptation? We probably have just a couple of minutes for some quick responses. So anyone who wants to jump in with what are the pieces that landowners aren't hearing, um, I'd invite you to respond out loud. I know you have an answer. Don't be shy. Okay, Nick is showing his camera, go ahead. I'm I'm topping up, Amanda. That's that's a really good question. I guess I, I, there's also a question: what what are are they hearing? Um, and so I, I don't know on that. And I I think you know the the parts that I think about that climate change. We know climate change is ongoing and accelerating, and nature is dynamic. And so we can't expect things in the future to look quite like they did in the past. I think that's a really important piece. And and you know, through stewardship, we play a huge role in what these places are going to to look like. Um, and and so, you know, it's not really clear how they're going to look. And so there needs to be engagement by people in the process. And there's that sort of co-production 
model for science and for stewardship as well. And I think platforms like this, these kinds of webinars are great places to raise public understanding awareness for conservation and, and for science and, and forest stewardship. Uh, there was a good question too about in, in the chat about spruce and how it's going to fare in the future. And you know, there's lots of uncertainty. That's true. You know, that's that's true of every anything about the future. It's, it's just great uncertainty. And so we need these protected lands, such as the ones we see here in Down East Maine, and we need the science, such as what Peter's leading, to help us. You know, better understand what the future may look like, and which species, tree species are going to thrive, and which will struggle. Just to quickly complement that with one sentence, I would say what um, what was said about the forest is dynamic and it's changing. So the expectation should be more part of the conversation. I'd say all the non-tree resources that aren't animals. I think that's something that I do not hear any landowner that I talk about knowing a lot about. It's mostly either trees or animals or, or fish. And, and so I think that's something that we could all, always do better. And we didn't talk about in this talk today. But uh, I think all the all the not all the you know the, the things under the canopy and the things on the trees too. Yeah, thank you for that, Michael. Did you want to pipe in? I did. One of the things that I see that um, that landowners that I get in touch with uh, don't give a lot of thought to is you know the, kind of the uh, holistic mindset of you know what some of their neighbors or their own management goals and objectives. Uh, you know how they all fit together you know when when people are kind of giving an eye toward like i said a more holistic um management um uh design you know so they're actually giving some thought into how what they're doing whether it's you know 15 acres or 15,000 acres you know how that impacts uh climate change or or you know carbon storage or sequestration uh, you know, and how it how that can um, complement, you know, or 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 even you know have a negative impact if done improperly with with some of what the um, you know their neighbors are doing, whether they abut them physically or or you know they're just down the road. You know, that's something that I don't see very many people giving much thought to. So that's something that you know I at least try to shed a little light on when I meet with with landowners. Like I said, whether they're large or small landowners and um, you know, usually it's a bit of an aha moment for most of them when you bring that up. I see that Aaron turned his camera on and I suspect that he might want to formally conclude and thank folks, but there was a really good question in the chat. So I'm wondering, Aaron, if you want to do concluding thank yous and then we can dive right back into the good question in the chat. Does that work for you, Aaron? Uh-oh, we can't hear you. <laughs> Okay, so I think what Aaron was going to say is we really, really appreciate all of our speakers uh, coming and being part of this today. Um, and we look forward to speaking more with you tomorrow um, and I invite you to put your contact info into the chat um, so folks can reach out to you directly with questions. Um, and uh, Meg, if you have information about uh, continuing education credits, that can also be posted into the chat. Um, we look forward to seeing a bunch of you tomorrow um, on, on the field tour at the Scudic, on the Scudic Peninsula. Um, so for folks that have to jump off, thank you so much for joining us. And again, a huge thank you to our speakers today. Um, and with that, I really want to get at this question that Joel asked. Um, so he was asking, given the age class structure of these forests, shallow soils and related health issues and lack of recent catastrophic windstorms, what are the management priorities for those lands that will be managed? So any of you are welcome to jump in and Michael and Steve uh, and Bob, please uh, turn your cameras back on if you have something you'd like to add. Don't be shy. Uh, I would just point out that the shallow the soils may be shallow, but a lot of these trees do have a, a way of tenaciously holding on. So um, you know these these forests don't necessarily just fall over on a whim, especially when they're intact. Um, it does take a pretty catastrophic uh, event to really really flatten large areas. So. Um, but no, they they can you know they can age and, and grow, and there are certainly areas where where they will do that. I think a lot of it has to do with what people's priorities are, and so whether if you're a, a you know a, a 
land conservation group, you may be looking to pri to prioritize that that older forest that that isn't um, on on the landscape as much. And you can certainly do that. It just takes a, a very long time. And um, there are things you can do to approximate the structure of a more mature forest. Um, you know, by um, felling some trees and leaving them on the ground, for instance, um, you know, creating that coarse woody debris, um, et cetera, you know, you can, you can kind of, um, you know, add some of those features sort of, or promote them on the, on the landscape, um, or, you know, maybe your, uh, you know, some of these landowners are going to want to have more of the, the early successional, um, and kind of keep it in that sort of old field, um, mindset so you know some of our lands are managed that way where we we recognize sort of the the more of the social history and, and um, desire for some of the species that are associated with those sort of regenerating fields and so you know not you know we have areas that we mow and keep in the field and we have areas that we allow to eat to, to grow and then you know sort of cut them aggressively to to reset the clock and and kind of keep that early successional habitat on the landscape so it kind of depends on on the the goals of um of the land the particular land manager and, and what they want great thank you yeah, thanks. Anybody else want to jump in with a quick response? These will be kind of probably the final thoughts. Uh, in response to to Joel's question, you know, one thing that I try to to um, bring up, especially with with a consulting forester, you know, or a stewardship forester that's writing a new management plan, especially if they haven't spent much time in the region, is that um, you know, you know, given the um, some of the challenges and whatnot that we've already gone over here in this in this area, the spruce and fir that we've got so much of here, you know, has on average a 20 to 30 percent shorter rotation age uh, than the same species further inland. So, you know, that's something that's worth taking in consideration when you're drafting a management plan with with entries, you know, scheduled or different prescriptions uh, that you're implementing. Um, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a, it can be a tough place to be a spruce or a fir tree around here. So, uh, you know, that's probably the biggest one that, that I share with people, you know, uh, in answering your question, so, but a really good question. Yeah, thank you. Um, Bob, I would love to hear your answer to this management priorities, since you've got a bunch of land you're thinking about over there. Yeah, I think that um, from management, uh, one of the things that we are thinking about, Maine Coast Heritage Trust doesn't necessarily manage its forests. Um, it's something that we have not done in the past, but as we have recently been accumulating um, or acquiring and conserving larger tracts of land, that is something that we're, we're looking at. Um, one of the things from a management standpoint is thinking about um, the the use and invasives are, are two key things that we're thinking from a management perspective and so um thinking about any recreational access types of trails and any um impacts that that might have or that um things like Winthrow I just went into the Forbes Pond property the other day and had to clear up about 12 uh trees that had fallen over the trail um over these past uh past couple months. And so um, those are things we're, we're thinking about. Again, um, it's something that um, we are uh, looking at from a, a use management perspective, um, but we need to be partnering more on that. Awesome, thank you. Um, we are a few minutes over. I usually don't like keeping people late, but that was a really nice question to help round out the afternoon. And I think it sets us up well for tomorrow. So we really look forward to seeing folks tomorrow and picking up these discussions about management priorities, about climate adaptation, about climate change impacts, about spruce fir and looking at you know local scale, looking at the larger scale and what all of this science can help us uh, how this, how all this science can help inform our decisions and how we communicate about climate change and uh, forest climate adaptation uh, in coastal spruce fir. So thanks so much again to everyone for being part of this. And I look forward to seeing many of you tomorrow in the field. Thank you.